Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, we're chatting to a man who loves barbecue almost as much as he loves his bright yellow hats and his Simpsons memes. Hey family, hope you're well wherever you are and you got that thin blue smoke rolling. Today's a great episode of the show. We're welcoming back a good friend of the show, Gus Gallagher from Perth Barbecue School. Now, I last spoke to Gus, must be three years ago, when we did the the Live in the Dream series of the podcast, where we focused on a whole bunch of different business models within the barbecue world. And uh, when I was talking to him just then, he was just in the process of opening up uh, Perth Barbecue School. He was moving from his um, his social media profiles of Gus Face Griller and leveraging that into the, the barbecue school business. And a lot has happened to him since then. So it's going to be really cool to find out. But before we get to that, I've got a few announcements I've got to run past you first. Now, the first one is that our podcast partner for today is Heat Beads. Heat Beads have been part of the barbecue family in Australia for more than 50 years. So if you're in the market for some good charcoal, get out there, get yourself one of those um, nice big bags of the hardwood lump charcoal. That's my favorite, and it's really good stuff. I always use it here at Smoking Hot Confessions. The next one is our Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. Now, this is a free ebook for you, um, available to you over at the SmokingHotConfessions.com website. It's been specifically written for those of you who are at the start of your barbecue game. If you're just starting to get into low and slow, this is a great place for you to start. So head on over there, go to the website, SmokingHotConfessions.com, have a scroll around, have a click around, a pop-up window is going to appear, put your details into that, and we'll shoot it right out to your inbox. Next, come on over to Facebook and join us on the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue community. Um, We are going to be starting doing some live recordings directly into that group of the podcast show. And so we've got some fancy new software that's going to let us drag comments and questions from the Facebook feed and put it into the video so we can uh, live um, present the questions to the guests. So that's going to be really cool. So make sure you head on over there, check that out. And it's also just a really nice place to be on the internet there. And of course, if you are watching this video later on uh, on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, a subscribe, and hit the notification bell. If you're on Facebook, give us a like, a comment, and a share. And if you are watching on IGTV, then we love the little love heart. It's really cute. And make sure you give us a follow. And lastly, if you're on an Apple podcast app, do give us a five-star rating and review. They are super helpful for us. Okay, so as I said, we are talking to Gus. Now, a lot has happened to him, as I said, since we last spoke to him. Um, It was actually two years ago. I'm just double-checking my notes here. It was episode 29. So if you want to go back and get Gus's backstory, how he got into barbecue, why he loves barbecue, all that sort of stuff, go all the way back to episode 29. It's a great episode. And if you're into barbecue business, check out that whole whole series. That was series two, Living the Dream. Um, so since I last spoke to him, he's opened a full-time barbecue school and he is literally living the dream. So I think you've probably heard enough about that from me. Let's get Gus in here. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? All righty, Gus, welcome to the confessional, mate. It is good to have you back. You're looking healthy and well. How are you? Yeah, good, mate. Good. Yeah, I can't believe it's uh, there's been quite a few podcasts in between uh, when we were last on. So, yeah, it's fantastic times. Yeah. Now, how is Perth going at the moment? Because I know that uh, some of our friends in Sydney and Melbourne are back on lockdown and borders closing. How are things where you are? Yeah, so Perth in general is uh, is doing really well. So, um, you know, pubs have been open since, I think, uh, May last year. The most um, important one, yep. yeah. Yeah, which, which is good. So we've been up and running yeah, around the same sort of amount of time. Um, I'm currently in uh, in home quarantine just because I went and visited uh, some of those dastardly, you know, eastern staters. So um, don't worry, there's nothing wrong with me. But uh, yeah, I just have to stay stay in because we've got the hard border. So at least on the plus side, it means I'm just uh, kind of back where it all began, barbecue in my, in my backyard for a, for a couple of weeks, which is quite nice. I was about to say that's almost got to be a like a fantastic holiday dream, doesn't it? Yeah, at first it was uh, it seemed daunting, but then um, yeah, I brought some of my work home with me, um, bought a few barbecues, and it turns out you can, you know, basically get deliveries from about anywhere in about twenty four hours these days. So yeah, it's, uh, it's it's pretty good. Nice one, nice one. So tell me then, what was the last thing that you barbecued? 
Uh, so last night we did, so we fried up the hibachi and we did some uh, bulgogi beef and uh, and some spring onion pancakes, so which is pretty good. So you're on a bit of a bit of a Korean inspired barbecue journey at the moment. Uh, I, I sort of, I do wish wash around a few different, um, sort of styles, but yeah, certainly, um, playing around with a few different cuisines and cultures, that sort of thing, I think is, is good fun. And that, yeah, the bulgogi sauce can't be, can't be matched. No, it's that super sweet, uh, pear syrup that they put in there. That's just so good. Do you mix the marinade yourself or do you buy like a jar of it from the Korean grocery store? I, I go to the Korean grocery store. Like I've, I've played around with it. Um, I don't know. I just, I can't beat it. So. Yeah, it's so good. My uh, my local Korean barbecue shop when I was living over there, just at the end of the street, used to put um, cinnamon in the uh, in the marinade, which was quite nice, actually, surprisingly nice. Yeah, so good. So, is that that little hibachi? Is that your favourite thing to cook on at the moment? Uh, I don't know if I can pick a favourite favourite child. So, um, yeah, it's good. I probably I, I've always used the bullet smokers a bit. Um, there's one behind me, which isn't weirdly placed, but. Uh, um, I've been just kind of like rediscovering their versatility as well. Like, you know, you can have like an adjustable height grill. You can just do all sorts of different things in them. So, yeah, probably probably that's still my current favourite, I guess. Yeah, the bullets are quite interesting because you can use them as a drum. You can hang in them. You can uh, take the sections out and just put the lid on, use it as a grill at the beach. They're really quite versatile. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I've been sort of falling in love with what I call poor man's asado on it in a way because, yeah, you can just – quickly kind of drop in extra, you know, add a bit of height, take out a bit of height. So I hadn't thought of using it as a, as a poor man's asada, but I like that. Yep. That's oh, cool. It's, good. it's a good idea. Yeah. So um, while we're talking about smokers and all the different things that you love, when I was over in WA about a year ago, uh, or just over a year ago for smoking in the Valley, I saw you had a giant uh, trailer smoker there. Tell us about that. Yeah. So um, the cruelest irony is I've, I've probably only cooked on it a, a very handful of times. So um, the the barbecue comp team, so myself, Dave and Nathan, um, we sort of spearheaded getting getting that made up by hot chili uh, smokers. Um, but ultimately it's destined yeah, for barbecue comps, which obviously in 2020 took a, a bit of a back seat. Um, but then also for catering. And so I'm, I'm sort of busy with the school, Dave and Nathan, uh, really spearhead that catering business. So um, doing yeah, all sorts of things like from weddings to just, yeah, birthday parties, that's kind of stuff. So it's dedicated much more to that. Um, you know, in terms of the school, as much as I'd love to use it in a class, it, it kind of defeats the purpose of showing up to a barbecue school if everything's, you know, cooked in a giant uh, trailer-mounted offset smoker because it doesn't really relate to the average average person's cooking experience as much. No, they wouldn't sort of be looking at that and going, oh, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, well, it's also, you know, it's like, oh, now I know how to cook on a, a giant two-ton rig that I don't have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd imagine that, that would be uh, quite a difficult sell to the classes if you were to try and do that. Yeah, well, I don't know. I think people will be into it, but it just, yeah, it just sort of loses its its relevancy a bit. But, yeah, she's a, she's a beauty. Um, we were going to try and get it to live out at barbecue school, but I just, I literally don't think we have the space and uh, to, to put it anywhere. Well, I was actually going to ask, would it make like a good visual draw card if you sort of taught the class in front of it, but you taught the class on, we're, we're, we're going to talk about it later, but probably Weber Kettles or I'd, I'd imagine something similar. Or yeah, would it pull it. focus from the class? Do you think people would spend too much time sort of pouring all over the giant uh, smoker and telling you how much it looks like a steam train and not uh, not paying attention to what's going on in the class? And you know what they would be doing is just lifting the lid every five minutes, like just touching it and lifting the lid and not leaving it alone. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It would be definitely a big shiny distraction for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we've been sort of, we've started talking about the school just a little bit there. And now, as I said in the introduction, I last spoke to you in episode 29. Since then you've, uh, you've gone full time in Perth barbecue school. So let's, let's rewind back to then and tell us about how Perth barbecue school started up. Yeah, so, I mean, I've been floating around doing barbecue for probably six or seven years just as a hobby, like, um, you know, much like yourself, just sort of seeing it all start to expand, you know, from the point where, you know, I, I remember being excited when we discovered things like the Australian Barbie Alliance and, you know, at that time there were a few hundred people in Australia into barbecue and that felt, you know, pretty wild um, and then escalated into, yeah, competitions, a um, little bit of catering. Uh, the first few classes, you know, a few people would ask off the back of running the blog for a while. Um, and I sort of, I'd resist it at first because I didn't feel like I'd finished learning, you know, barbecue. Um, and so I wasn't sure if I was ready to teach, but uh, 
they, yeah, they went really well. Um, at that point, I was more interested in just make, making the hobby self-funding. Like if I could make barbecue money, I could buy barbecues with it. That was my thought process. Yeah, um, I hear that one. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, it just escalated. Um, you know, I was sort of, I just kept waiting for the classes to fizzle out. Um, I was like, oh, this will this will fizzle out. It can't go on forever. And then I'll move on to, you know, a new adventure. But it, it just didn't. And I guess I'm still surprised that it hasn't um, in, in that respect. Um, and then, yeah, quickly quickly got to the point where it was like I had to choose between the real full-time job at that point in time or the uh, the barbecue job. And I went with the barbecue job. What was that like making that decision? Was that just like gut-wrenching fear or were you fully like you just knew this was going to work? Uh, it wasn't so much that I knew it was going to work, but uh, we're at a, because I also had a six month old at the time of making that decision is now three and a half year old. Um, but it was more just that something had to give uh, between full-time job, barbecue job and, and parenting. And the parenting part couldn't, couldn't be the thing to give. Um, <laughs> something had to give. And so we thought, let's, let's make a run at it. Um, you know, see what happens at least because it had been going for a little while, you know, for, for sort of six or so months, um, Prior to that, at least that made it was sort of a warm start, not a, you know, not a kind of cold jump into it. Yeah, cool. And so what was the the hardest thing about getting the school set up and running? Uh, I mean, in terms of full-time, it just kind of just progressed naturally, I, I, I suppose. Um, the hardest part for me in the very first two classes we ever did um, is turns out Weber kettles take up a lot of space uh, when you're trying to transport eight of them, um, you know, so you don't have the economies of scale that you would taking a trailer smoker somewhere, you know, those, those kettles do certainly take up a bit of space and sort of transporting everything in and out of venues. Um, you know, that, that was definitely hard work. And when it's just doing a, a couple on the side, you can make it work, but as soon as it's full time, you, know, you think, well, I can't just be carting this stuff around every single weekend. Yeah. Right. So eight, eight Weber kettles. How do you, um, like, are, are they for show? Is it like a like a talking point? Are they all different colours and different vintages? Or do you actually have something cooking in each of those different ones at the same time? In the in the first few classes, um, so the first couple of classes, it was solely Weber Kettle. Um, so the first class was called the Weber Kettle Basics class. And I think off the top of my head, it was, I, I was sort of guessing around eight. It was around seven to maybe eight or so. And by the end of the class, I'm pretty sure they'd all, all had a run. Um, and whether they're all going simultaneously probably just depended on, you know, whether everything was still going or not. But yeah, it was pretty close to, uh, cause feeding 20, 20 or so people, um, does, does potentially take, uh, yeah, around eight kettles because, uh, from a catering perspective, you obviously wouldn't do that. Um, you wouldn't cater for someone in a dozen Weber kettles unless you're an absolute psychopath. Um, that's just madness. But obviously for the class, again, I wanted to, to completely translate to how they would cook it at home. And so that does mean, yeah, firing up multiple, multiple little barbecues instead of one big kind of, you know, um, one big unit. Yeah. Trying to manage 12 separate fires at one time would just be maddening. Yeah. So, but, but at least for, for 20 or so people, that's all right. But yeah, if you were doing it literally for catering, you'd, you'd, you'd go absolutely nuts. I'm sure. Yeah. No doubt about that at all. And so then what has been the best thing that you found about uh, opening Perth barbecue school? Uh, probably a hundred percent the community. Um, you know, it's, there's no other business like it. I don't think where, you know, I remember in the early days, students would be like, Oh, I did a hand putting down that marquee or taking that back to a trailer. And, uh, there's, there's not many jobs like that where someone's paid to be there. You know, you, you get a trade around to your house, you're not like, Oh, let me know if you need a hand getting all those cables out of your car or something. Um, you know, it just doesn't happen. And so, yeah, the community astounds me. Um, the lengths people are willing to go to, to help you out um, is, is amazing. Yeah, that's really interesting uh, that you say that because um, I cannot remember the last time I offered to help a, uh, a a landscaper bring bricks into the yard or yeah. the, the, the plumber to fix the toilet. I'm like, whoop, <laughs> that's yeah, all yours. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah, so it's wild like that. I just And, and so, I, yeah, I certainly pinch myself around that because it, it still happens, you know, even now that we're sort of in full time, it, it still happens and it weirds me out, but it's, yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's always a lot of learning that, that has to be done almost sort of instantaneously when you start running your own business. So what are, what were some of the things that have uh, sort of been, been difficult for you to, to pick up and to learn that, that you've struggled with? And, and how did you overcome that? Yeah, true. So, yeah, like, like running any sort of small business, yeah, suddenly you're, 
you're wearing every hat, you're doing the marketing, you're doing, um, you know, the bookkeeping, all that sort of stuff. Um, I guess probably yeah, bookkeeping definitely the I uh, probably the, actually definitely the administration side of it. So um, my wife Sharon definitely stepped in and sort of spearheaded that. In fact, I can remember specifically when it happened. So I used to always have twenty people in a class, um, and the way I'd start the class was I'd look around, do a quick head count, twenty people, let's roll. I'm real good. And uh, and then one day I went home, I was like, thirty nineteen people at the class today. And she's like, well, who didn't come? I'm like. I don't know. I just did a, did a head count. <laughs> She's like, all right, I'm doing the administration, get out of it. Um, and so, yeah, started forging ahead into, um, yeah, running more sort of systems around that. And certainly as, it, as it's evolved, you know, what once was acceptable, like a spreadsheet full of gift vouchers or, you know, spreadsheet full of names becomes unwieldy, you know, once you grow to, to more and more classes. And so learning how to, to roll with those, um, sort of growth movements to then make it a better system and, you know, online bookings, lots sort of stuff is uh, definitely part of the fun. Now I, it's funny that you mentioned online bookings. I was um, sort of having a scroll through your social feeds and um, your classes have become so popular that your students are actually crashing the website trying to book tickets. Is that right? <laughs> so the, to be fair, that happened once. The, the, the crashing thing happened once. Uh, we got a, a new website. Um, done up and it was and this was actually for a Christmas class that I didn't think was going to be that popular because it was about a week out and I thought oh this would be a good way to, to test the new website out um, and then yeah and then the whole thing crashed from the uh, popularity so they just they didn't realize barbecue was that popular I guess and so we had to, to move to a new server and you know this sort of reroute the, the mainframe or something so um, yeah it was pretty pretty wild but yeah that was sort of a, that was more of a one-off I think we're, we're pretty good now with the crashing part. But certainly on the back end of it, you know, it's, it's great to have all these online things, but there's so many different boxes and things to fill out that it's yeah, definitely been a learning curve and you sort yeah. of take a step backwards before you take two steps forward. Hopefully. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So what what sort of came to you easily then? Uh, so surprisingly, um, surprisingly probably the, the public speaking part of, like barbecue glass, uh, which surprised me just because in my old job in, in finance, I hated public speaking so much. Um, oh, interesting. Like, like just, I hated it so much, but I think when it was suddenly about something I was so passionate about, that part came a bit more naturally to me. And so, yeah, that certainly surprised myself because it was the thing I would avoid the absolute hardest. But I guess, yeah, it was probably just a different, different set of circumstances then. Um, and as soon as it was something I cared more about, um, it became a little, little bit more natural. And then probably the other one is just weird metaphors. Love a, love relating something back to a metaphor. Um, if I can, uh, just to help explain things to people. Um, yeah, as much as possible. Yeah. It's kind of funny how the different motivating factors can play such a big role in, uh, in, in what you find enjoyable and, and un- unenjoyable, disenjoyable, unenjoyable in, uh, in, in different roles. Um, so if you were to do it all again, what would you do differently? Wow. Yeah, I guess, I mean, probably, I mean, you set up the booking system and everything properly from the start, I suppose, uh, because you can predict, predict those, uh, predict those issues. But I think the, the crazy thing about barbecue and you look at a lot of the guys that are full time, I think the reason it was a success is because you never thought it was going to be a full time business, you know, and, and, and you're probably like, it's sort of the same where, you know, this thing has escalated, but it was that kind of crazy volatility of it that sort of made it what it was as well. Um, so I think it would be hard to, yeah, if you looked back at, you, you can't really, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you can plan, plan it like that. Fair enough. So get into the systems first. Well, I guess, um, a bit, a bit like barbecue. It's like, if I'm going to cook a brisket again, I'm going to do it so differently. And then it might be a different cook. And, uh, you know, sometimes these things, you know, you can go and replan it and then the whole thing takes a, a different journey anyway. But yeah, I would probably just get a good website from the start. Barbecue, it's all about family. And a huge part of the barbecue family is Heat Beats. In fact, they've been fueling Australian family barbecues for over 50 years. So there's a very good chance that your kids, you, your parents, and your grandparents have all eaten delicious meals lovingly cooked over Heat Beats. One of their most popular lines is their hardwood lump charcoal. It's 100% natural, chemical-free, and the lumps are large and consistently sized, giving you a reliable burn every time. 
It burns hot and is low ash, making it not only perfect for backyard cooks, but also commercial cooking units. So grab your favourite grill, your secret recipe, a bag of heat beads and your nearest and dearest and make some delicious lifelong memories. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. Alrighty, so we kind of can't sort of keep going without sort of addressing the the giant COVID-sized elephant in the room. So 2020, COVID hit. How did that affect Perth Barbecue School? Yeah, so I guess and we just talked about looking back at everything. Um, in hindsight, COVID so far, um, Touchwood has been been pretty good um, in that we were, sh- we were shut down for two months. And in the middle of that, it was it was terrifying. Uh, we weren't sure how long it was going to go on for, whether the business was going to make it through. But off the back of that, because Perth has been pretty lucky, um, you know, around the end of May, we were allowed to start running classes again. And since then, everyone's just been mad for barbecue and also just mad for at least for local businesses because, you know, travel restrictions are still around. Um, but a lot of Perth, you know, didn't really stop in that you had FIFO happening constantly. And so people sort of, you know, they had, had you know, their regular income still. And, you you know, if you consider you've always got a bit of disposable income for things like travel and, and all sorts of other things, uh, people were spending it in Perth. And so, you know, pubs, Osbo in general, um, even like one guy I know said his mate ran a tattoo parlour. He was booked out months in advance um oh, local wow. businesses have been yeah have been having a pretty good run and so in the grand scheme of things it's hard to say because we were growing a little bit anyway but i'd say at worst we end up probably just back to square with what a normal year might have been um with you know bearing in mind that sort of two months and we were also l- lucky slash unlucky in that um, the time that the lockdown uh, hit our business, we'd already scheduled uh, a month off the business to go to America. So oh, I'm like, right. yeah, on the 1st of April, we were supposed to be flying to the States, um, which yeah, sort of was right about peak craziness in Australia. So it was yeah, obviously unlucky for the, you know, the travel, um, but lucky in that we'd had a month planned off the classes. So at least we could go, well, look, we weren't going to be having people through the doors during that time. So, you know, we're there for that. So you already budgeted and, and and allowed for that then? Yeah, correct. And so at least that, you know, if you look at the silver lining, that made it um, a little bit more feasible. Ah, oh, fair enough. Tell us about that US trip. Like I I know it's really sad that, that you couldn't go, but I'll, I'm always fascinated to know like uh, what, what people's barbecue journeys are. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to reminisce about that trip I didn't go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, the main, the main thing we were doing was about 10 days in Texas. So we were going to be based out of Austin and, uh, and yeah, just hit every, I think with our list that we had, it was going to be roughly, I think, two to three barbecue joints a day was the, the wow. shortest. We, we hadn't culled it further because it got to the point we didn't need to, to cull it any further, but that was the current short list <laughs> before we'd gone, um, which was, was kind of daunting. Um, but yeah, so that was, we were looking forward to that a couple of days in New Orleans and a couple of days in San Fran was the, the plan. So, but yeah, oh, so so you, Texas you were, one day we'll, we'll go back over to. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So what were some of the names of the barbecue joints that you were going to go hit? Uh, definitely, uh, Mueller's, um, definitely Lou Mueller's, um, uh, definitely Franklin's like you've, you've got to, I'm, I'm not a guy that lines up for much, but you just, you just got to do it. Um, yeah, snows. Also, a lot of the, the Mexican base places as well, because Mexican food in general, and I think we was seeing a lot of this around barbecue. Is just I think the the next the next wave maybe because you know salsas and um, all that freshness make barbecue I think a bit more interesting again. So certainly like Valentina's, for example, uh, was on the list, um, and yeah, there are a few others. I'd, oh yeah, I have to find the list. I probably burnt the list in a in a COVID rage. Probably, yeah. Yeah, we were supposed to be over there about the same time again and uh, just actually got an email finally, just literally about an hour ago, saying that Qantas had um, decided that they were in fact going to refund our tickets. So, yes, we're going to get that money back. So, Oh, nice. Yeah. Or almost 12 months later that the uh, 
that the government shut all the flights and things. So yeah, 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 yeah. We're still we're still waiting on that one because it turned out we booked through STA, which uh, has also got under. So, oh damn! Yeah. So, so did you that, did you lose yeah. all that money then? Yeah, we're still debating that with them, so we'll find out. Right. Yeah. Well, fingers we'll crossed out. for you, mate. Yeah, it's all good. Is what it, uh, out of all the crazy things to happen, it's sort of yeah. Is what it is. Yeah, yeah. So then, with uh, with COVID happening and and all that, um, how have you had to adapt what you do at Perth Barbecue School? Yeah. So again, that's been a rolling adaptation, I suppose. So as it stands at the moment, um, we're fairly cruisy in WA. So when we first started back up, we had to have like uh, markings on the floor, sort of spacing people out. Um, I'd mark like well, not march, but it. Um, like I insist on people like washing their hands on arrival. This is like, I, but I like watch them. You know, there was no trust, trust in people anymore at that point. Um, now it's sort of a pre- pretty much back to normal. Like I still have to tell adults to wash their hands, which is, is weird, you know, having to treat someone like a child like that. Um, but in terms of like spacing and, and all that sort of stuff, it, it's pretty normal in Perth at the moment. Yeah, it's um, it, it's quite good up here at the moment as well. Although interestingly, I did go to the Apple Store in Robina yesterday evening, and the whole Robina Town Centre—it's a huge mall—and uh, only the Apple Store was still doing COVID restrictions. So they they still had uh, one entry, one exit. They had about eight staff members actually out in the the central hallway part of the mall and yeah. trying trying to uh, deliver out of shop service to as many people as possible. So I was going there to pick up a new computer and I, I, I just told them my name. They wouldn't let me in the shop um, and they went out the back, they got the computer and gave it to me and sent me on my way. But all yeah. the staff were in masks. Uh, they had masks available, handing out to people that, that wanted them. And yeah, it was, uh, it was just the one shop in the whole place. It was weird. Yeah. i tell you the spookiest thing recently was um, coming out of Sydney Airport um, literally the last plane out of Sydney, um, like the song goes. Um, I was about was to say, one, isn't that a cold chisel song? That's right. Um, the last plane out of Sydney was going to Perth, it turns out. Um, yeah, yeah one yeah. departure listed there, about three arrivals. The place was empty, like not a single thing open. It was, it was fucking surreal. So, yeah, it was, especially from being in Perth, you know, where everything's been pretty normal for a while. It was, yeah, certainly a culture shock. Yeah, yeah. Bit like a zombie movie, like a Romero film or something. But yeah, you drive into the airport. It's like one of those, yeah, the empty, empty landscapes. It's uh, yeah, super weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how is Perth Barbecue School going to be different moving forwards now? It's a good question, and what I've been thinking about because normally around this time of year, I'd try and do a bit of sort of forward planning. Um, after the the unpredictable year that was twenty twenty it just feels weird to, to plan. And so to be honest, I haven't done a lot of planning past around, like we've got March dates uh, up to the end of March. We've got all our dates sorted. And then beyond that, uh, it's kind of just a wait and see because it just feels odd for me to sort of, uh, yeah, to plan that far in advance. Whereas normally I probably would try and plan out a few more things, but uh, yeah, I guess going forward, it's just doing, doing what we do. I'm trying to just be appreciative of the fact we can run our business and run classes, um, you know, after, yeah, the weirdness that was, yeah, last year. It's just nice just to be able to, to do do our thing. Um, but, yeah, I guess going forward, probably the, the one goal that was a goal last year is to run more specialised classes. Um, I, I, I really enjoy them. So, you know, we've done seafood, brisket. Uh, we did a Christmas class, um, only one of those, but I'm going to do more of those. But I'd love to keep branching out into other, specialist areas, uh, you know, maybe Argentinian barbecue or, you know, again, like try and involve different other subject matter experts around, maybe things like Korean, um, Japanese grilling, um, because, yeah, I find those the most interesting for me because you get to learn a lot doing them. Yeah, you get to sort of uh, experience a lot of other cultures and different flavours and uh, all that sort of good stuff. Yeah. So talking about those those specialized classes, I did see something that's that looked really interesting. It was called Brisket Lab. What a great yeah. name. Can you tell us a bit about Brisket Lab? Yeah, so Brisket Lab, uh, so myself and uh, Don from Big Don Smoke Meats, uh, we started that class uh, a few couple of years ago, two years ago, I think, uh, mainly just because there's so many brisket myths out there and, and brisket's the most common one. You know, people 
it's like this bugbear and they, they jump on, they've just seen an episode of Barbecue Pit Masters and they bought a smoker and they're like, I'm going to cook a brisket uh, for my first cook. And it's like, well, anyway, it's, you know, it could have been maybe the, not the smartest thing to cook for your first cook. <laughs> right? You jump on, you guys, anyone got any tips? And I, and I heaps of people have tips and some are, some are more right than others, or you know, also just some are right in certain sets of circumstances, and then you, you mash them all together, and it can be pretty confusing. So we and, and also we wanted to compare side by side a lot of the different techniques as well because there's so much bias in cooking. And what we realised, and, and what we realised after the first class um, was, you know, we were like, oh, let's find a winner out of all these different styles. But on the day, you're going to make mistakes or get some briskets more right than others. And so you might not be able to settle a paper versus foil debate or a this versus that debate because maybe you just took one off a bit too early or, you know, that sort of thing. And so, you know, and, and people go, oh, this way is the best way. And maybe just everything worked for them that day. So, yeah, it's been a fun ride, the old brisket lab. And certainly teaming up with Don, you know, he, he cooks what, hundreds of briskets a month, something like that, or 100 briskets a month. Um, whereas with the school, I don't cook a lot of brisket um, outside of, Outside of school, I'm not going to just fire up a brisket for, for me and the family necessarily these days. Um, whereas that experience you get cooking literally that many briskets, um, I, I feel like, yeah, you, you can't can't really buy that. So, No, absolutely, yeah. I've seen some of his uh, his work with those huge smokers he's got, and, yeah, he, he does a lot of briskets. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about some of these brisket myths, then. I'm interested to know some of the best uh, – what are some of the most interesting, outrageous – brisket stories that people have come to your class with? I suppose brisket stories, but I guess, um, you know, you see all these tips out there, like probably one one that comes up a lot is the old hot and fast brisket, you know, just smash them out in four or five hours. Um, and I think, you know, especially because in Australia, we used to do it like originally, and probably you were the same when you got into it, you know, it was all 225 Fahrenheit, 110 Celsius stalls took four hours. You're like, I cooked a 16 hour brisket. Um, and then there's a, and that just took so long. And you thought that was just the way. And then the pendulum kind of swung the other way. So like, Oh, you don't need to do 16 hours. You can do four or five hours. Um, and, and you certainly, and you can, and, and definitely can. And we do one in the class and it's a, it's a good brisket, but uh, I think one of the myths is that it's the same and it's certainly not, I think low and slow, and we've, we've sort of, I think, I feel like we've proven this is, is better. It doesn't have to be 225 Fahrenheit. It doesn't have to be 16 hours, but, you know, sort of around that probably 8 to 10 hour mark, 8 to 12 hour mark, depending on, on how everything's running for you, maybe around 250, 275 Fahrenheit um, seems to be the sweet spot um, because you can get them done yeah, quickly, definitely, and they, they will be edible and enjoyable. Uh, but I do think there's trade-offs you need to be aware of. So those uh, those four to five hour briskets. Are you talking about drum briskets or just in general, just crank the heat up and just go for it in, with whatever smoke you drum, got? But we do an inner drum uh, for the hot and fast, but ultimately you could you know you could achieve hot and fast in any barbecue. It's sort of for us that means probably above north of uh, three fifty Fahrenheit. Certainly once you once you start going north of three hundred, you're definitely in that territory. Um, Don likes to make me just push it as fast as possible because he. I don't think he likes them as much. So like, just keep punching it up. But around that 300, 350 Fahrenheit mark is, I'd say, you know, that's probably about where that hot and fast mark is, is really starting to take hold. And you, you also mentioned that there was some big differences between the flavor or the, the taste of a 12 hour versus a hot and fast, like a low and slow versus hot and fast brisket. Can you talk a little bit more about that and tell us about what some of those differences are that you've discovered? Yeah. So I guess the, the first one is there's certainly a time at temp element and so you know you've got all this collagen connected tissue and fat to break down and render um and so you just don't have that time to do that and even if you're cooking at a higher heat you it, it can be hard to break all of that stuff down and so you might get it some of the meat's tender probably the most common hallmark characteristic of, of hot and fast brisket is when you see that cross section slice that's got a bit of point and a bit of flap and um, you'll notice a lot of webbing and sort of intramuscular stuff still in between those two muscles. Um, whereas if you go low and slow off and that will start actually dissolving away a little bit. And so that webbing definitely probably probably the, the first part. And then certainly with the drum smokers, um, and, and I guess, you know, every pro is sometimes a con and, and vice versa, but with that radiant heat, you get a, more of that kind of roast beefy kind of like um, Maillard reaction on there, which I, I think detracts away from that sort of proper Texas brisket sort of style. And so you start getting it 
more like a steak kind of maillard on there, which, are, you know, if you're into that, I guess, you know, um, maybe that's for you, but you start kind of toasting and burning the pepper a little bit. Um, if you're going a traditional kind of salt and pepper rub on there, um, you know, Franklin often talks about using that old old pepper to, so that you can go pretty heavy handed with it and not make it too spicy. But if you start toasting that pepper, it's actually going to really wake up that spice. And again, that might not be something that, that you're up for. Oh, that's interesting. I'd, I'd never thought of that, the way the different spices react to different temperatures. Yeah, so, so salt and pepper will be the last things to burn. Certainly the sugar in that rub um, and you're running hot and fast, you'll 100% burn that um, burn that sugar and burnt sugar tastes like garbage. So yeah, yeah. you don't want to do that. Um, but even at salt and pepper, you know, it's, it's, it's fine, but it, like, you know, on a steak, if you consider the amount of pepper you've got on there, kind of toasting that and, and sort of charring it up a bit, it's fine. But if you've got a super heavy coating on there and you've got that radiant heat, you uh, might wake up a bit too much of that, uh, that pepper. Yeah. Very interesting. Now, the other thing that I just want to ask quickly about, what's the deal with you and ham? There's photos of you, like in 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 front of a uh, like a billboard that says ham. There's photos of you holding a ham. There's photos <laughs> just of the ham by itself. I, like what's what's the deal there? So that was um when we were used to run the classes uh, varsity project in Morley. Um, I think it was just coming up to Christmas, and there was this graffiti kind of across the road from there with the ham on it. Um, and so we we're like getting ready for Christmas, and I was like. We got to do, go do a photo in front of that, in front of that ham, graffiti. I just felt it felt like it felt appropriate. So um, we're cooking ham. There was a big thing saying ham there, so it was more just uh, yeah, a good excuse for some uh, some funny content, I guess. So was it just a <laughs> random coincidence, or was that like was it uh, like the wall of a supermarket that they got a graffiti artist to graffiti for them, or was it just pure coincidence? As far as I'm aware, it's just random street art. It's just at the back of a car park. Like it's, I don't, I don't okay. think it was planned because um, it's just, it's pretty much on its own. I, I'd, it'd be weird if it was a commissioned mural, I think. Like, can you go paint and ham at the end of this <laughs> weird car park? Um, oh, if you, yeah, so, if it was on the, like if it was, if it was an outer wall of a butcher shop or something, I could understand something yeah, like that. But yeah, uh, no, it's not, not really near anything. So yeah, it's just, but it, okay. I could see it from where we were in the class. I'd, I'd drive past it every day. And so then it was just something just, tucked away at the back of my mind there that I've got to do something, something yeah. with this big old ham graffiti. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. So when you do your ham, do you like to get a raw shoulder or leg and, and cure it yourself? Or do you, do you buy them pre-cured and then uh, smoke them from there? I buy them uh, cured and smoked. So, you know, cold smoking a ham is a pretty onerous process. And I, I feel that the commercial smoke houses are probably just better equipped to actually make a great product. So you still want to go to somewhere reputable, you know, get a good free range pork that's been sort of, yeah, smoked at a commercial smokehouse. But I feel like they probably get a better result than, uh, than I would um, because they're, yeah, for that cold smoking really geared up to, uh, to get that kind of high level of, of smoke there. You know, if you go into them, they're big stainless sort of setups. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think they've got the facilities and the capacity to, to really turn out a great product. Plus the thing I love about, Christmas ham, and this is what half of what started the Christmas classes is glazing a pre-smoked ham is basically the easiest thing to do in the world, but it looks cool. Everyone's going to lose their minds, um, and so it's the perfect thing to do at Christmas. Yeah, I I do love uh, smoking and glazing a ham here. So, what um tell us a bit about how you like to do it. What what type of smoker do you like to use? What what's your favourite uh, flavour? I I love a nice orange sort of tart orange uh, glaze. How about you? Yeah, so I, I played around with the most uh, most years. So the most recent one, if you like the tart orange, we did a Campari glazed ham for Christmas this year, um, just gone. So that kind of hit all those sort of marmalade kind of type notes in there in the end and gave it that that beautiful kind of red, red colour in there. Um, ultimately, yeah, we've done all sorts of apple and bourbon, that sort of thing. I mean, they all come down to one key ingredient, which is an absolute shitload of, of, uh, of sugar and so you know each every time i release a recipe about 20 people go i'm like oh i've read your recipe uh is that seems like a lot of sugar i'm like yeah it's not a typo it's a glaze which is in fact mostly sugar um so yeah that's the, the key component i love a, i love that color in there because you know let's be honest theater is a a pretty big aspect of the uh the glazing process you know you don't actually end up eating arguably a lot of glaze um, 
So, you know, I think that colour is an important part of it. In terms of uh, barbecue, it's got to be the Weber kettle for that one. Like, I love all my barbecues, but Christmas, the Weber, like, that's what got me into to barbecue for sure, is Dad doing, like, Christmas roasts, things like that on the, the Weber kettle. So I feel like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm 100% biased in that regard, but it's got for me, it's got to be the Weber kettle for the ham. You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd, Ben Arnott. All righty, Gus. Now, in the third part of the show, this is where our, our guest gets to share some wisdom with the, with the viewers and the listeners. Um, and so today, you're going to talk to us about some of the most common mistakes that beginners make. So I'm going to throw it over to you now and, um, yeah, share some wisdom with us. Yeah, so... Um Obviously, yeah, you asked uh, asked before in the lead up to it about uh, teaching a lesson and all that sort of stuff. I was like, wow, what are, what are we going to cover? But yeah, I thought we'd talk about, um, yeah, some of the most common things I see at a barbecue school um, and maybe, yeah, maybe we'll help, help people out. So, yeah, probably the, the first one, I wrote these down just because I get distracted. Um, the first one that, that comes up at the start of the class, generally bad smoke. Um, cause we've all been there, I feel like, and I just, I just always see this light bulb kind of moment often go off for people where, you know, starting off, you, you've read some website or book that says, oh, you got to get all these soaked wood chips. Um, and you got to do a pile of these smoked wood chips onto your barbecue. And then you've got all this, and hopefully it's just water that you're soaking it in, but sometimes even people soak them in beer and red wine, which is a waste of alcohol. Just, it, and if you drink the alcohol, that'll make your food taste better. So that's a, that's a free tip, that one. Um, but then you've got all these wet wood chips, the smoke billowing out. And I've got this Facebook memory that comes up in my feed each year. And I love it. It's a reminder where I've got this, there's a picture of the wood chips cause I took a fucking picture of the wood chips and then I've got these wet wood chips. And then the next picture is smoke just pouring out of these two barbecues. And I think my comment, <laughs> my caption thing on Facebook, I'm like, you smoking some food. And I was so excited. And I look back and I'm like, oh, and the food, yeah, it wasn't great. And so that, you yeah, know, that heavy smoke, it's going to overpower the food. It's going to make it taste bitter, um, you know, not particularly enjoyable. But it's just funny because you see people go, I see what I've been doing wrong all this time. Um, because, yeah, you think oh, I'm smoking food. There should be a heap of smoke everywhere, right? So, uh, so that's really the first one. Uh, the second one, the low and slow cooking, uh, which is, is still commonly you see a lot, is undercooking low and slow cuts is, uh, you know, is a, is a big problem because, and you see it, I always throw brisket under the bus with this one, but, you know, undercooked brisket, you see people throw out these slices of it and everything about it from what you're used to cooking when you get stuck, you know, when you're just cooking regular food, fry it low and slow, it looks like overcooked roast beef. And so everything in your brain is saying, oh, I've just, I've overdone it. And they jump online and they're like, oh, I've got overcooked my brisket. And then someone goes, actually, you undercooked it. Uh, cook it for longer. And in Australia, being the smart ass, you know, nation that we are, um, you know, someone's like, cook it more. You're like, it's not helping me, mate. Um, you know, I'm, I'm already sad about my overcooked brisket. Um, but yeah, so everything about it screams, you know, don't keep cooking it. But, uh, so it's hard to, I think, make that leap of faith until you've seen it actually happen. Um, because we're so geared up to be scared of overcooking things. Um, and so, yeah, things like obviously an overcooked steak, worst thing in the world. Don't, don't do that. And so, um, yeah, undercooking is, is a big problem with low and slow cuts because people get nervous about taking it too far. Um, and then finally, um, probably the other sort of, I guess, one to round it out is just kind of overcomplicating and overstressing everything. Um, and, and again, these are all things that, you know, you've probably done all these things as well, like I did, um, is when you start off, you're like, oh, I've got, a, I've got four probes taken out of stuff and I'm spritzing every five minutes and I'm injecting things and I'm worried about them and my temps are changing. And if you just relax um, and just not, go, you know, not add all these different things in and not kind of have a, a million probes hanging out of everything, half the time you'll actually be better for it. And so people definitely get too geared up. And, and the internet makes it hard, you know, same with the brisket lab. Why we do that is because you jump into any hobby, like whatever hobby it is, um, and there's just like, you know, the people that have been doing it for a while just arguing all these fine points and different things. And so you can get pretty confused and overwhelmed and you end up doing, you know, so many different things at once and, and just kind of ruining the day for you. Yeah. It's kind of funny that you mentioned that. I remember one of my first uh, low and slow efforts back in the days before Facebook groups um, of forums. And um, I was going out every 10 minutes and checking the 
um, the Meat Probe. I had one of those $35 hardware store yep. meat uh, wireless meat thermometers that they only work once or twice and then you've got to throw them away and get another one. <laughs> anyway, and every 10 minutes I was writing down the, the temperatures of both the fire and the meat and then yep. I put all that into a spreadsheet, screenshot the spreadsheet, posted that into the forum and said, this is what I'm trying to do. Does it look right? Da, da, da. And people were just writing back saying, what is wrong with you? Why are you why why are you spreadsheeting every ten minutes the, the, the temperature variations? Just have another beer, relax, and just let it do yeah. its thing. Yeah, yeah. Now, I just want to loop back to something that you said before. You mentioned um, soaking chips and chunks in beer and wine and whatnot. So, are you uh, pro soaking or anti soaking? So, if they were soaking in water, would you be happy with that, or is are you anti soaking altogether? Anti, anti soaking altogether um, for the most part because I feel like it's going to give you bad smoke. Um, there's always yeah, you know, there's always exceptions in life. I feel like like there's definitely a time and a place for for that bad dirty smoke. Um, you know, like if you were cold smoking a ham, for example, you need that. You actually need that white white smoke, and um, that sort of heavy smoke. Um, so yeah, soaking wood chips and, and chunks generally against, with maybe a couple of exceptions. Soaking in alcohol, though, 100% against. Um, you know, cooking is pretty subjective. I'm, I'm willing to admit that there's subjectivity to these things. I feel pretty strongly about that one because the only thing that's escaping in that smoke is just the steam, like the water and the pure vapors. The flavor is staying in there. And so I think it's just a straight up waste of alcohol. Um, yeah, don't get me started on beer can chicken because that's another criminal offense <laughs> of, uh, of alcohol. But, uh, yeah, soaking them, and especially when people use, like, nice alcohol too, it's just like, ah. But, uh, yeah, I think just drink it. That that will make your food taste better. Yeah, I always sort of am, am taken aback when people tell me about how, oh, yeah, I've I've soaked my, my chunks in bourbon for the last 48 hours and blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking to myself, that's a very expensive pile of wood yeah. ch- chunks that you're now just going to throw onto the fire and just yeah. let it burn. Now, I can I, I can totally understand buying old bourbon barrels like the what the bourbon's been held in and yeah. burning them, I can I, I can understand that. But uh, yeah, just going down to your local bottle and buying 120 bucks worth of bourbon to tip into a bucket and throw wood chunks in it, yeah. I, I I just yeah. cry at the waste of the bourbon. I, ironically, ironically, the uh, the bourbon might actually get better from the the chips, right? Like because because uh, oaking <laughs> oaking bourbon, that. you might actually so wood can make alcohol better. Yeah, yeah. That one. But, uh, I don't think it works the other way around as much. But uh, yeah, I had a I had a, a huge supply of Shiraz barrel staves at one point, just from a, a mate that's a winemaker, and I, I don't think it made a huge amount of difference to be honest. It it looked cool, and they smelled they smelled amazing before you put them in there. But if you had just plain oak, I, I don't think you would notice a smoke difference. Um, but everything about it, and this is the one caveat I'll have is there is this kind of provenance or storytelling food of food that you know occurs. And so when you tell someone like this was smoked with Shiraz barrel staves, their brain's just like already going, wow, that's so good. Um, and so that's that storytelling of food, like it's, it's part of it for sure. And so that aspect might make it taste better, but just surely the mental part, but I don't think it will actually, but and the hard part with the subjectivity is again, to, to really nut it out, you'd have to have some sort of blind, you know, double blind study, all these people locked in a lab that you're like, feeding, you know, this one's oak, this one's Shiraz. Um, and yeah, the government hasn't funded this uh, Mizani scheme just yet. So. I actually did just some uh, just some backyard tests myself of uh, soaking chunks in a in a bucket of water overnight versus just chucking chunks in dry, and yeah. um, I honestly didn't find any difference whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. It was it was cool. just and it was just an, an, an extra complicated um, step that you had to think of twelve hours beforehand. Oh, I've, I've got to go throw those wood chunks in a bucket of water to get them ready for. Tuesday, so I can cook overnight, so we can eat on Wednesday, and I was like, ah, get rid yeah. of that. Well, I remember, like we, you know, in terms of weird anecdotes, I think it was probably like the forum days and things as well. Um, it was, I think it was someone said, you know, if if wood soaked up water as readily as you think it is, they wouldn't make boats out of them. <laughs> I was like, I remember that. It's been years. I remember just reading that somewhere, and I was like, that's a fair point. Very <laughs> good. Some one. sort of water taking in sponge, you know, they'd make pretty terrible boat material. So. <laughs> yeah, I I had never th- uh, thought of that, but yeah, that's exactly right. Now, just quickly, tell me about beer can chicken. There was such passion in the voice, then I've got to ask about the beer can chicken. Uh, so yeah, so beer can chicken. Look, um, the best thing it does is hold the chicken up. 
So it's like a poor man's rotisserie. Um, again, in terms of flavour releasing from the beer can, at, at best it's maybe steam coming out. So an expensive beer will make no difference. Um, and then there might not even be steam because if you consider that beer can is sort of shoved all the way up that uh, that chicken, um, if you consider the internal temperature of chicken, you know, could it be anywhere maybe from like 60, 70 to 75 degrees Celsius? Um, and so that can in the middle should only be, you know, well, maybe 60 to 70 by the end of it. And so you're not going to have a lot of steam coming out. Um, that's been a, one thing I want to myth buster at some point is have, you know, an empty away the can before and after. I just haven't gotten around to it. But yeah, at the very least, it's not adding any flavor. So if you're going to do it, drink the beer, maybe put a bit of water in there. Um, again, the beer will make your food taste better if you drink it. So. But yeah, that is actually what I'm, I used to. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the reason I get enraged is I'm also on craft beer pages because I like my craft beers, and you see someone with like a ten dollar can of beer, and it's like, oh, okay. it's just yeah, it's bad times. Yeah, what I used to do is I I would drink the can of beer and then just put some water in it and then some aromatic herbs. Yeah, perfect, perfect. I don't even know if the herbs are doing anything, but yeah, at least you drank the beer. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's probably a good point now for us to start wrapping this up. So I'm going to throw it over to you now. Give some thanks, some praise, some shout-outs to people that have uh, have helped you out along the way and tell everybody where they can track you down on the socials. Perfect. Yeah, excellent. So uh, thanks. Oh, I always hate the thanks because I end up uh, forgetting too many people and so I'm like, a, uh, um, but yeah, obviously my wife for, for spearheading the business with me, uh, definitely – uh, David Nathan, the competition team, and spearheading the, the catering side of it, obviously, and the respective partners are definitely part of the barbecue school uh, family as well. Um, James, my current sort of uh, offsider, he's running his first class this weekend while I'm in uh, home quarantine, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of suppliers and things like that, there's, there's too many, so I'm just going to say a, a vague all my suppliers and people that help us out because that way can't be accused of forgetting, forgetting someone. Um, in terms of socials, uh, on Facebook and Instagram, you can find us on Perth Barbecue School. Um, and then I do still keep the Gus Face Griller Instagram around as well, just because it's too hard to build Instagram accounts these days. So I just begrudgingly holding on to the one with more followers. So um, they're probably the, the easiest way. And I am trying to pump up a bit of YouTube in quarantine as well. So we've got a Perth Barbecue School YouTube that's uh, hopefully going to see a bit more content going on it shortly as well. Sounds great, man. You, you're doing some great work there. Thank you very much for your time and thanks for coming on board the show. No, thank you, man. And there you have it, family. That was Gus Gallagher, man. How funny is that guy? He just loves his barbecue. He loves his school, loves his students, and above all, he loves the barbecue family. That was really great to catch up with him again, and it was great to really bust some of those myths that those barbecue beginners do make. Now, before we round out this episode, I just want to remind you to do go and check out Heat Beads. They've got a beautiful range of charcoal. The charcoal chimneys are super robust. Mine's 12 years old, has lived outside in the weather all its life, and it's still going. Barely, but it's still going. But 12 years outside, come on. Um, head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com, grab your ebook, The Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. Jump onto Facebook, join us at the Smoking Hot Confessions barbecue community. We're waiting for you. We're really fun people, really relaxed. Everyone's welcome. All the guff is left at the door, and we just hang out and talk about barbecue. It's really cool. And, of course, just a reminder then, if you're watching on YouTube, give us the thumbs up, the subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Facebook, it's a like, a comment, and a share. Instagram, it's a heart and a follow. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, give us a little five-star rating and review. It takes 30 seconds of your time and helps Apple push our show out to more people. So that is about all the time that we do have for today. As I said, we are moving to the live recording format, so do head into the Smoking Hot Confessions barbecue community on Facebook. Check that out, and I'll see you there. So until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions.